do you do, ladies and gentlemen? It is our privilege to bring you at this time an eyewitness report of the first international trepidation contest. We are speaking to you from the ringside of the great Maple Leaf Auditorium, which is packed to the rafters with spectators, eager and curious. For the benefit of my listeners who are not acquainted with the facts relating to this event, it might be well to describe the two contestants. Lord Windesmere from uh, Wapping Fog Hall in Devonshire is, of course, the champion of the British Empire. The challenger is Paul Boomer, native son of Australia, who, I understand, worked his way to Canada in the crew of an ocean freighter carrying a load of Melbourne cabbage, upon which, uh, so it is stated, Boomer trains exclusively. Uh, ah, I see now there's a bit of a flurry around Lord Windesmere's entrance. And yes, here he comes, Lord Windesmere. I'll see... I'll see if I can get him to come to the microphone and say a few words. Joe! Joe, will you see if you can get his, get his lordship to come over here for a minute? Uh, tell him it's for the radio. Okay, I'll get him for you, sir. Uh, thanks. Well, uh, Lord Windesmere appears to be in good spirits. He's smiling and chatting. Thrown about him is a beautiful silk dressing gown of perfect purple velvet upon which is worked, I imagine, to be the, the coat of arms of the House of Windesmere. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, good boy, Joe! Uh, in just a minute, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to have his lordship himself come to the microphone and say a few words. Right over here, please. Right over here. Yeah, yeah right here. Yes. Yes, folks, here he is. Right at the microphone, the champion himself, Lord Windesmere. Uh, Your Highness, uh, how did you come to take an interest in this uh, unusual art? Well, I suppose you could say it all started over Lady Windesmere's fan. I see. Yes, I noticed... She was constantly waving this fan in front of her face, so I asked her why the deuce she did it. And so she retorted that if I insisted on constantly crepitating, she had to fan away in pure self-defense, you see. Well, uh, uh, my friends were drawn into the controversy and persuaded me to capitalize on my proficiency and sort of, uh, sort of go in for it and all that. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. Thank you, and good luck to you. That was Lord Windesmere, a champion crepitator of the British... Oh, and here's a challenger. Here's Paul Boomer from Australia. Paul, over here, please. Please ask Mr. Boomer to come over here, please. The radio. We want to speak on the radio. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll have Paul Boomer for you right away. Yes, here he comes. His attendant has just pointed us out. And uh, how did Paul... How? Oh. <laughs> he just waves his hand in greeting and starts walking over to the microphone. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Paul Boomer. Uh, will you say hello to our audience, Mr. Boomer? Hello, Canada! Uh, now tell me, sir, when did you first realize that you were proficient enough to take a uh, uh, shot at the uh, Empire Championship? Well, ever since I was a little nipper, I liked to fart. I remember I used to make my mother and father laugh their bleeding heads off when I used to let one go in church during the announcement of the ladies' aid. Hey, excuse me. Mr. Boomer, on the radio, we call it uh, crepitating. You see. Now, look here, Cobber. What I always says is a fart's a fart, whether you raise up on one cheek and sneak or whether you give it a full blast like I do. Very well. As long as the CBC is no objection. <laughs> I personally find the four-letter word much easier to say and uh, more descriptive than the longer and more academic uh, crepitating. Thank you. And I would like to say... Oh, and there's the bell. Thank you, Mr. Boomer. And good luck. Paul Boomer hurries off to the center of the arena to meet the champion and to receive instructions. Now the house lights are dimming and the great flood of high-powered electric lights cascade down onto the center of this great arena where stands, in simple eloquence, the farting post. The farting post is about four feet high and is decorated with red, white, and blue bunting up to about nine inches from the top. The bare top section is worn smooth by the grip of many hands in previous contests. And now it appears that Paul Boomer is to be the first at the post. Now that, I believe, is customary for the challenger to make the first effort. Yes, Paul Boomer takes off his dressing gown and strides to the farting post. He grips it firmly around the top and flexes his knees. The signal to commence has not yet been given, so we may assume that these are just preliminaries. I think I have time to describe Mr. Boomer's outfit. He's stripped from the waist up and wears a tight-fitting trunks of powder blue trimmed with scarlet. These trunks are similar to those worn by wrestlers with one important difference. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a hole about six inches in, the di in diameter removed from the seat. This, of course, has been done for obvious reasons. This symmetrical aperture is called the fenêtre de brise, literally translated meaning the Zephyr window. Mr. Boomer's fenêtre de brise has a scarlet trim around its perimeter, giving a very 
provocative air to this genial Australian backside. Uh, oh, and there goes the signal to commence. You might have heard it over my microphone. A, a blast on the medieval Bronxuzar Spiegel, the traditional woodwind instrument associated with this sport for centuries. And now a hush falls on the vast, the vast throng as Boomer walks slowly, deliberately to the farting post. He's exuding confidence and he gives one last all-encompassing grin to the tense audience as he grips the farting post between a pair of hands that look as though they could splinter the post. Now he flexes his knees, much in the manner of a boxer. He seems to be concentrating on the very top of the farting post. You can hear a pin drop, and here it comes. Oh, a beauty, a beauty. I think it was a tr triple flutter blast. Yes, that's what the judge signals. A triple flutter blast. That gives him 25 points right off the bat. A and, and another, another of the same, and another 25 points. That followed by one, followed by one, no, two fuzzy, I beg your pardon, three fuzzy farts in rapid succession. It's amazing how this man can change pace and style of offering by a slight, simple shifting of his buttock area. He's still gripping the post in complete concentration. Boomer now has a score of, uh, uh, of 65. Those last three fuzzy farts at five points apiece, adding 15 to his previous score. And now here's something coming. A flooper! A flooper! A perfectly executed flooper! What's that? I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That was a follow-up flooper. A follow-up flooper. The second time in the history of this sport that a follow-up flooper has been achieved in open competition. The only other time, I believe, was during the World Series held in Europe in 1783. During the course of this series, uh, Francois Fouf, the famous French father, after leaving uh, a follow-up flooper, defeated Sandy McWind, his Scottish opponent, by only one bloop and then dropped dead. As you know, since then, in honor of Monsieur Fouf, the bloop had been dropped from open competition. And now the score is 105 for Boomer. Flooper, of course, counts 10 points, but a follow-up flooper, a very difficult maneuver, gives 40 points. Well, this certainly has been a whirlwind session. I think that Paul Boomer is about played out, or blown out, as they say. What, what am I saying? There's a fuzzy fight and another. That gives him 10 more points. And he's not through yet, apparently. Wait a minute, here comes a, a three. Oh, oh, a little three. Worth only two points and very dangerous. Uh, and another, and, and another three. Well, not bad. Well, he's certainly putting up a fighting finish. Four threeps, a very hazardous, uh, very hazardous fart because of the danger of plotching. But giving him eight, a very valuable point. And there he throws up his hands. He throws up his hands as a signal that he's finished. And the crowd gives him a tremendous ovation. He's, he's sitting down, looking a little pale, a little wan perhaps, but smiling, smiling happily at the crowd. This man has a definite charm about him that has endeared him to all except the most rabid Windesmere fans. And uh, his result, wait a minute. Oh, Boomer! 123 points! Did you hear that, Paul Boomer? 123 points, a world's record, beating Lord Windersmith's previous world mark of 119 by four points. Paul Boomer, this moment, is the world's champion. But for how long, we don't know, because Lord Windersmith might take it right back again. And here's his lordship now walking up to the post, apparently not in the least disconcerted by the brilliant performance of the challenger. He's outfitted a little differently from Paul Boomer. He has purple tights, full-length tights, and around the fenêtre de brise, you remember the hole cut out from the center of his seat, around this there's a fringe of little gold tassels about four inches long. This no doubt is some decoration affected by the, just a moment. There seems to be some sort of a dispute here. Paul Boomer and his seconds are on their feet and seem to be arguing with the judges and, and pointing to the fringe on their champion's posterior. Oh, I see. I see Paul Boomer is claiming that the fringe might add a whistle or some other sound to Lord Windersmith's efforts and so increase their value. And after all, in a closely fought contest like this, every little advantage must be jealously watched. The judges appear to be agreeing with Paul Boomer, and they direct the champion to remove the fringe. He doesn't like the decision very much, and the crowd is getting... The crowd's getting resentful. They think he should be a better sport about it. And I agree with him. Oh, he seems to have decided that he's got to give in. And he rips off the fringe and flings it to the ground. Then he walks over to where Boomer is sitting. He turns his back, puts his hands on his hips, and oh! Oh, he leaves a three right in Paul Boomer's face. The crowd get a, a kick out of this. As you know, a three is a very low scorer, only two points. 
but to throw one away just in a gesture of defiance demonstrates the spirit of dash and recklessness which has made the Englishman the champion that he is. He's smiling disdainfully now as he returns to the center of the arena. He nods to the judge to show he's ready. And he, hello, what's this? He's not going to use a farting post. Lord Windesmere, the champion, in a final gesture of contempt, scorns the use of the farting post. Well, this is developing into a bit of a grudge contest. He has his hands on his hips, feet apart, knees slightly bent, and ah! a sizzler. His first attempt is, a, and another one, two in a row, and another one, a third. Three sisters in a row, a tremendous effort. 60 points in his first 30 seconds. This one. And one, two, three, four. Four fuzzes, four fragrant fuzzes in rapid succession. It's a pleasure to see the ease and comfort with which his lordship leaves his fart. Perfect technique. And now his score is 80 points. 80 points in the first 30 seconds of the post. Now he's getting ready again. Hands on hips. A little bit red in the face. As he strains to... Oh, something there. Wait a minute. Something's wrong. His attendants run into him. He's in some kind of distress. I see. Yes, the judge's signal. It was a plotcher. Oh, hard luck, your lordships, a hard luck. The champion left a very bad plotcher and will be penalized 15 points. That puts him back to 65 points, 59 short of the 124 he needs to retain his championship. He's all set again and seems to be straining a little more cautiously. And here is... A fundus break. Oh, a beautiful bit of wind-breaking virtuosity. A most difficult, a most difficult part to perform without plotting. This man has wonderful control and the crowd are really warming up to him. That last, that, that fundus break counts 30 points and it takes Lord Windesmere up to 95 points. Point. It's getting very tense now and here it is. Here is the next one. A trail blow. A trail blow. 10 points followed, followed by a resounding single flutter blast. I think that is. Wait. Uh, yes, the judges uh, proclaim that to be a, a single flutter blast. A lovely, a lovely change of pace there and now the excitement is growing unbearable as the champion uh, takes a step away from the post and his score is 120. Just three points short of the Paul Boomer mark. Just three points short. If he gets one, one more fuzzy or two small freaks, it's all over but the shouting and the challenger will have to return to Australia with his shattered hopes. I think everyone's heart aches for Paul Boomer. He's really a great guy, but uh, Windy Smear steps up to the post again and looks very confident as he gets ready for the killing. And here it comes. Uh, a, a three. A three. That's two more points. A little small three was all it was. Two points. And now it's practically over. Just one more of those little threeps. Those little two-point threeps in the contest will be over. It seems as though his lordship was deliberately tormenting Boomer by dallying. But Boomer's smiling. It's a forced smile, but he's trying hard. He's sitting there trying hard to take it like the grand sportsman that he is, but he can see defeat standing ready to sweep away his dreams at almost any instant. And now Lord Windesmere steps forward and hello, hello, he's going to use the farting post for his final evidence. He grasps the post, uh, flexes his knees, it looks as though he's going to try for a high scoring effort for a whirlwind finish, perhaps another Sisler. And now he's trying very hard, the veins are, are starting out on his forehead and even the trickle of perspiration venturing down his temple seems to hesitate so that this mighty last effort should have undivided attention. Now, the suggestion of a smile from the champion. He seems to have decided just what treatment is going to give this final bid. I see the audience almost to a man is on its feet, breathless and tense. He closes his eyes. A look of pure ecstasy on his face. Oh! Oh, he's sick! The champion is disqualified! A 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a special service feature, we have brought you direct from the ringside of the Maple Leaf Auditorium a blow-by-blow -blow description of the first trepidation contest held under international auspices. This broadcast replaced midweek meditations usually heard at this time.